Okay. So, uh, last time, uh, we were talking about uh, <coughs> anti-differentiation by parts and uh, integration by parts, and uh, we more or less uh, finished that. So, by, by last time, I mean uh, last lecture, right? Because, uh, because last time we took an exam, and then uh, before that, we uh, reviewed for the exam. Uh, so, the last uh, lecture where we had uh, New stuff to say. We we uh, we finished <coughs> integration by parts. All right. So uh, now we're in section uh, eight point two, which is uh, called volume and uh, average value. Okay. So uh, the the main thing for today is uh, is uh, well, recall that the integration procedure, uh, what it does is it uh, cuts a shape uh, into rectangles and then uh, uh, computes the the area of each one of the individual rectangles, uh, adds them up to make an estimate, and then uh, lets the number of rectangles become infinite. So what it is, is it's sort of an idea uh, that says, uh, let's, uh, let's take a shape that we know, rectangle, and uh, let's proceed to cut every single shape that there is into rectangles. And that's, uh, uh, even if you don't use infinitely many rectangles, it's still a pretty good uh, idea with just finitely many, because for example, this screen that we're looking at, uh, in fact, is just uh, actually consists of little bitty rectangles. Uh, and uh, what are their names? Pixels. Pixels, right? That's all that they are. If, uh, like here, y'all can't really see this monitor, but y'all have seen a monitor before. If you look close enough at a monitor, you can actually see the pixels, like if you get your eyeball right up on it. And uh, you can do the same thing here. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> what we're going to do today is instead of uh, cutting uh, things up to compute areas, we're going to cut things up to compute volumes. All right, so here's the beginning. So suppose that uh, we have a shape, <clears throat> and it's a two-dimensional shape. That is to say, it can be, uh, it can be drawn on a plane, and uh, it looks like this, more or less. So just some kind of peanut thing. It's not very important exactly how it's uh, shaped. <coughs> so uh, because it'll be relevant in just a second, I'm going to draw a little axis here so that you can see uh, how we're looking at it. So those, all I mean is that, uh, like, you know, that's some shape, and there's the origin there. It all fits on a plane. So now we're going to uh, rotate this a little bit so that we can see it uh, in perspective. So that uh, now it uh, still looks a little bit uh, like a peanut, but we're kind of looking at it uh, from the side. So uh, this one, the vertical axis is still going up, but now this one is kind of going that way. Uh, it's the difference between like looking at my hand like this and uh, like that. So I kind of turned it that way. <clears throat> okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to take this shape and I'm going to sort of push it that way. Uh, specifically what I mean is that um, <clears throat> I'm going to attempt to copy this shape as best as I can. So that's supposed to be a duplicate. Uh, this is a right angle. This is that same right angle, but looked at uh, from perspective. And this is that same right angle, but looked at from perspective. <coughs> now, there is a, a dashed line going this way. Uh, 
And what I'm saying is that uh, now all three of these, one, two, and three, are all at right angles to each other. So that uh, you know, you've got uh, one, two, and three. And uh, what, what we've done is we've pulled uh, this one to the right a little bit. And what it's done is swept out this, uh, this volume. So that uh, what we're looking at might kind of look, you know, uh, maybe a little bit like the body of a violin. All right. So this is some kind of, you know, some kind of violin, little bitty violin there. Uh, here's the thing. If this, if this shape has area A, That is to say, somehow it's not relevant, but somehow we measure it, uh, and uh, the, the area turns out to be A. Uh, that means that this one, we rotated, it still has area A, because that doesn't affect its area, so that still has area A. Uh, but uh, what I want you to consider is that what if, what if that distance right there is delta x? That is to say, we took that, uh, we took that shape of area A, and then moved it to the side, uh, a length of delta x, then this object has a volume. What's the volume of this object? Oops. <coughs> What's going to be its volume? It, well, that's the length, that's, uh, that's, you know, if you were to get out a ruler and measure just that bit right there, or, you know, any one of these right here, like, that's delta x, delta x, delta x. Yeah? Exactly that. A multiplied by delta x. Okay. It's, interest, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, fact that that's the case that uh, you take a two-dimensional shape and then you uh, extrude it into the third dimension, a distance of delta x. The resulting volume is whatever the area was multiplied by uh, the length of the extrusion. Okay, good. So now, uh, this is kind of a general case of a special case. Uh, so let's consider the special case when what we're looking at is a circle of radius r. So of course, uh, a circle of uh, radius r is a specific kind of two-dimensional shape. Uh, what's the area of it? Pi r squared. OK, so now I'm going to do exactly the same thing. Is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to twist it uh, into perspective. So then I'll make this uh, a little uh, arrow like that and arrow like this so that uh, to give you a cue for what, uh, what the perspective change is. <clears throat> so when you, uh, when you twist a circle into perspective, uh, the result looks uh, more or less like, uh, like an ellipse. Okay, so now we're going to give it a push. <coughs> and uh, the result is a, a shape that, uh, unlike this one, you know, you could arguably say this is kind of like a violin. But uh, this one that uh, I'm making right now is uh, so common that it has a, a name. What's its name? Cylinder, right? <clears throat> so 
So I'm uh, using the convention that a, a dashed line means uh, that's an edge that's not visible. So you can, uh, the perspective is saying that uh, you can see sort of this front side, but uh, not the back side. All right. So uh, suppose, uh, you know, uh, the normal name for the radius of a cylinder is R. So suppose that uh, that's R. Oops. And uh, the normal name for the height of a cylinder is H. But to understand what it was, it's a, it's a circle, and then we uh, extrude it into the third dimension, uh, a distance H. So what's the volume of the cylinder? If the peanut thingy, exactly that. If the peanut thingy was uh, area times the distance of the extrusion, then it's exactly the same case here. Right? It's area area and then uh, multiplied by the uh, distance of the extrusion, pi r squared h. Of course, the usual formula for the volume of a cylinder doesn't uh, include those parentheses. I just put those parentheses there so you can see, oh, yeah, area times uh, the distance of the extrusion. And of course, normally we're looking at uh, cylinders like that. But uh, all day we're going to be looking at them like this. Uh, any question about this? Yeah? Today? Yeah, we're the, it, sketches are going to be required, but uh, this is not an art class, and it's not going to be graded on that level. And uh, I'll only give you things that uh, I think everybody reasonably has a chance of, of, of drawing with reasonable success. <laughs> I, I, I'm with you, you know, like I, I, have, a, I have a small repertoire of things that uh, I can actually draw. Okay, so uh, now what, uh, what we want to do is uh, we want to take this idea and uh, we want to make it to where uh, we can find uh, the area, the, sorry, the volume of uh, entire classes of shapes. So to, uh, to explain uh, the kinds of shapes that uh, we're interested in, they're the shapes that are going to look like this. So we've got uh, the horizontal axis and then uh, two, two limits here like this. So this would be something like A and B. And then uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'll draw sort of, you know, the standard thingy. Now this is just some, uh, you know, some function. And uh, if this is, uh, say, function, the, the, the graph of function y is f of x, and uh, that's the, this is the x-axis here, then this area that I'm shading, we've studied this problem. Uh, how do you find the shaded area? An integral, right? You, you integrate this function from a to b. Okay. <clears throat> and remember, conceptually, what the integral is doing is it's cutting this shape into rectangles. All right, but uh, so well, that's not the problem we're studying today. We already did that one. Uh, rather, what we're going to do is we're going to take this shape, and uh, we're going to uh, we're going to <clears throat> uh, revolve it around uh, the around the axis uh, like so. Oops. So we're going to take this and uh, sweep it around the axis. And uh, the result is going to be uh, a solid that uh, kind of looks like a, a vase that you could sort of, you know, grab. OK. So here we go. How do we successfully draw such a thing? <laughs> so uh, the result is not, it's not too bad. You just have to sort of follow a recipe. So OK. Now uh, it's going to have to. It's going to need to be symmetric, 
top and bottom. So the trick is, is uh, instead of drawing them that long, we're going to draw them that long but on both sides. So, you know, it extends all down, similar with this one. Okay. Uh, so now, for this one, uh, I see that there's a dot about right there, so I'll draw that dot. And then, from that dot, uh, you've got to draw a symmetric one down here on the other side. Okay, so, you know, this is not an art class, and I'm not going to use a ruler to measure what you've drawn. You know, just, you know, more or less. Uh, similarly, there and uh, there. Okay, so the, this is the main trick. If you, can, uh, if you can get these placed more or less right, then the rest of it works out pretty good. So now this is a little wavy thingy here. And then, you know, you've got to do a, a symmetric wave over here. So notably, I'm not going to go up. Right, because that wouldn't be symmetric. You have to go uh, out. You know. So it'll have to be, you know, if it, if it helps, you know, you can do it like this. But again, it's not an art class. Okay. Uh, now, uh, so now we've uh, got it there. Now this uh, this this point right here, as it as it revolves around that single point. Uh, if you were to trace its trajectory in space, what uh, what would it trace out? That single point. A circle, right? So if you could uh, just like look at it, it would uh, just trace out a circle as it uh, revolves around. Uh, now we're drawing it in perspective, so then uh, you'll see what you'll see is something that looks like this. And it's more or less like the top of that cylinder there, right? And uh, similarly, this uh, point right there will do a similar thing. It'll still be a circle, but it'll be a, a circle of larger radius. We'll be able to see this one, but uh, the other half of the trajectory will be hidden behind the object, so I'll draw it dashed. And this is about uh, the, the limit of what I expect. Okay, so then, I, I, to me, this seems about... Uh, reasonable, more or less, for anyone to do. And again, to sort of drive the point home, what if, uh, what if we consider this, this green point, which, uh, you know, maybe was originally that green point right there. This green point, as you, as you uh, watch it revolve around, okay, what will it trace out? A circle. You'll be able to see that part of the trajectory, but this part will be hidden behind it. <clears throat> okay. Any question about uh, the shape? So this is a solid uh, object. It's uh, like a vase, but uh, but uh, you couldn't pour anything in it because it's already full of junk. Well. Uh, there's definitely, I'm going to draw, I'm going to make uh, very significant an analogies, yes. But uh, in the end, uh, this is what we did before. We took a, a shape, which was a two-dimensional shape, and then we cut it into rectangles. Here, this is a three-dimensional shape. So uh, this, this shape uh, has, a, has an area. This uh, shape is going to have a volume. But in the end, we're gonna, it's, the same, it's the same kind of idea. We're going to cut this up into pieces and then add up, the, add up the volumes of all the pieces. All right. So, well, to that end, the, uh, we, we cut this thing up into rectangles uh, to find its area. Is it reasonable to cut this thing into rectangles to find its area? Not really. I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by kind of. I'll say this, uh, area is a two-dimensional measure. Is this, a two, is this one a two-dimensional object? No. Nah. Yeah, so rectangles are, aren't, uh, aren't going to do it. They aren't going to accomplish our needs. Because a rectangle, uh, its area is a two-dimensional measure, and uh, we need a three-dimensional measure. OK, so we're going to have to do something else. But uh, I think you'll agree that uh, what we're going to do is definitely related.
I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, uh, so soon we're going to begin, not today, but uh, soon we're going to start talking, instead of the area under the curve, we're going to talk about the volume under the surface. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, to that end, uh, please remember that uh, the way that uh, we, we did this, uh, the way that we found the area under a curve is we said, uh, okay, here's the, here's the curve. Oops. And then uh, what we said is, okay, well, uh, how about we uh, cut this into four rectangles? Uh, so we cut it into four rectangles, four, four strips there. And now in each strip, we're going to uh, estimate uh, the area uh, as a rectangle. So how about uh, like that rectangle and that rectangle and that rectangle and that rectangle. Uh, so that corresponds to uh, a sampling down here. Of we sampled at that point. We sampled at that point. At that point. And at that point. Okay, so then this is a <coughs> plot of y is f of x. Uh, we, uh, we, we made all of these strips have the same uh, width. So what is the common width of all these strips? What was our name for it when we were discussing integral the first time? Delta, Delta x. Okay. Then uh, the name that we gave to the sampling points uh, because there were four strips, uh, we named them according to their index into the strips. So, you know, we called this one C1 and C2 and C3 and C4. Okay, so now let's uh, specifically look at, uh, say, the rightmost rectangle. So let's have a look uh, just at the rightmost rectangle. Uh, doing that, uh, you know, it looks like this. This has a base delta x, but what's its height? What's the height of that rectangle? You've got to look at the picture to make the determination. And it's something to do with C4. Yeah. It's a, so for, for specifically the rightmost rectangle, it would be F of C4. Okay, because uh, that's what it means, the sampling point, is that uh, that's where you're sampling the function. So its height is uh, F of C4. Uh, so then uh, that means that uh, the estimate for our rectangle, the estimate for our rectangle I'm uh, oh, sorry, the estimate for the area using these specific four rectangles would be, uh, you know, F evaluated at C1 delta X plus F evaluated at C2 delta X, base times height, base times height, plus uh, F evaluated at C3 delta X plus F evaluated at C4 delta X. Okay. Now that's pretty tedious to write. Uh, don't we have a better way to write that? The sum, right? The summation notation with sigma. So this will be, uh, you know, the summation from i is 1 to 4 of f of ci uh, times delta x. 
Okay. Such fond memories of, of doing this, right? And then, uh, of course, uh, I drew a, a picture with four rectangles just because, uh, well, that's relatively straightforward to do. But uh, if this was not good enough for our engineering problem, then, uh, you know, what I mean is if, if this were not accurate enough for our engineering problem, what could we do? More rectangles, right? Uh, for every engineering problem, uh, there's some number of rectangles where that's good enough, right? Uh, in the end, that appears to be definitely the case because the, you know, we're all, after all, made of atoms. Eventually, the rectangles get smaller than the atoms, okay? <laughs> but uh, the calculus point of view is that uh, let's not stop. Let's just, uh, let's go all the way to the logical conclusion. Let's use infinitely many rectangles, okay? Now, what does this have to do with, uh, you know, how am I going to jump off from this point? Uh, and accomplish the answer to this, this question? Well, uh, actually, pretty straightforwardly, to be honest with you. So let's consider, uh, what, if, what if for the moment, uh, <clears throat> just for the moment, I, uh, I make a copy of that drawing, so I copy, but, uh, but without y is f of x. Uh, that is to say, I'm going to make a drawing that has four strips, and I'm only going to have the rectangles. I'm not going to draw the red, because that uh, is a little too complicated to look at. So still with the with the four strips there. Uh, this is the this was the tallest one. The next one was a little less tall, and then a kind of a jump there, and then a little bit less of a jump. Again, this isn't supposed to be perfect. Okay, just to get the idea. So all I did was I copied it, uh, but without the red. And now, now I'm going to do the rotation thing. Now I'm going to do this. Rotate it like that, uh, and I'm just going to look at uh, what the what the rectangles do. Okay, so now uh, let's uh, you know that's a little bit of a complicated looking thing. Uh, let's imagine for the moment that uh, we just have that one rectangle there, and we just revolve it around uh, the axis. What kind of shape is it going to uh, result in? Not a rectangle. A cylinder, right? If you take a, you know, you can imagine that this is like a paddle, uh, like, a, like, a, like a water, like a, uh, a boat paddle, I guess. Uh, it's going to sweep around, and the shape that it sweeps out is going to be a cylinder. And in fact, uh, that's true individually of each one, right? That one's going to sweep out a cylinder. That one's going to sweep out a cylinder. Each one of them individually will sweep out a cylinder. So uh, let's do it. <clears throat> well, what I mean is that, uh, like, here's a, here's, a, here's a rectangle, okay? So, uh, and you're looking at it from the, from the from edge on. If I, if I take it and I sweep it out like this, can you agree that uh, that sweeps out like a, a cylinder? Alternatively, uh, if you look at it like this, and I sweep it out this way, the shape that I'm sweeping out uh, is a cylinder. Or... Uh, each individual point sweeps out a circle, but uh, what I mean is that, uh, well, what's a good, like, real world example that everyone would be familiar with? Well, uh, you know, uh, how about uh, like, uh, like making a cake? Can, can we agree that, uh, you know, that's about an inch and a half? That might be a reasonable layer for a cake uh, that's made of multiple layers. Uh, if, if we had a little bitty uh, cake pan that uh, had this radius, 
then I could uh, clear out the whole cake by doing that all the way around. A little piece of cake. Do I have anything? Uh, maybe a different example would be something like this. Like here is a more or less, besides, besides this thing, an actual cylinder. What I'm saying is that, uh, it, it, imagine that solid, is that uh, this like sweeps out. This, this part is held right in the middle, a cylinder. Okay. <clears throat> so, the resulting picture still consists of kind of these four strips, but now I made them extend equally on both sides because it's got to be symmetric. So uh, here I see that, uh, okay, if this one's about this tall, then its counterpart will be that far, but on the other side, like so, and then a little bit less, a little bit less, kind of big jump, kind of big jump, a uh, lesser jump, a lesser jump. Okay, so now uh, we've got the, the symmetry, more or less. And then uh, now let's draw in the edges that uh, we should uh, be able to see. So we should be able to see uh, this one, but not the one behind it. Uh, we should be able to see this one. And in fact, we'll be able to see it just for a moment before it goes behind the other one, so it'll kind of look like that. And we'll be able to see this one, like that. We'll be able to see this one, and this one for just a little bit before it goes behind. So in the end, the reason why I went with cake is because that's, I knew I was about to draw this, and uh, well, that's what this reminds me of, reminds me of a cake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, so what I mean is like th this, uh, this little, say, this rectangle right here, it uh, comes up off the page and back into the page and sweeps out that cylinder right there. That, that single one. And then uh, all of these go up out of the page, down back into the page, and make this. Okay. Right. You might consider that uh, this is like a, a rotisserie. <laughs> I keep going with food. I must be hungry or something. <laughs> It's like I, I grab this and it, it stays perfectly still, but I'm like uh, twisting it. And uh, it, uh, it does this. Okay, so now let's uh, find the volume. Let's look at just the rightmost one. <clears throat> let's find uh, the volume. Of the rightmost. Uh, cylinder. All right, so uh, looking at it, uh, it will look something like this. I've, I've drawn it uh, enlarged just so we can look at it. So uh, the two uh, the things that we need uh, to measure to find its volume are uh, radius and height. 
right? So then, uh, well, let's figure it out. Height is a little easier to do. So here's h. <clears throat> So in the, in the end, what is the height of this cylinder? Well, it's a consequence of, of having made this choice. Right? So what's the height of the cylinder? Delta x, right? Because uh, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's that length right there. But uh, every one of them is delta x. So that means that uh, the height of every one of these uh, cylinders is uh, delta x. Besides that, uh, we also need uh, the radius. And uh, what will that be? Well, in the end, uh, can you see that uh, because, because each one of these is revolving around the axis, that means that uh, whatever these heights are, that's the radius, whatever these heights are. So then it just comes to, it comes down to, well, what is the height of, for example, uh, well, because I'm asking specifically for the rightmost one, what is the height of the rightmost uh, rectangle? It's f of c4, right? So the radius is uh, f of c4. So those are the two measures that are necessary uh, to do that, so uh, to find the volume of a cylinder. So therefore, we can say the volume is, well, on the previous page, we established or recalled uh, that the volume uh, of a cylinder is, of course, pi times r squared times h. And uh, for this specific uh, situation, that would be uh, pi times f of c4, square that, times delta x, pi r squared h. So that's uh, the rightmost cylinder. So can we agree that uh, the one to its left, its formula would be pi f of c3 squared h, and the one next to it, pi f of c2 squared h, etc. <clears throat> so therefore, the volume of all four cylinders, it's a sum. We could say, well, it's a pi times f of c1 squared delta x plus pi times f of c2 squared delta x <laughs> plus dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I'm going to elide just the third one because I've, otherwise I'm going to run out of paper here. Uh, pi f of c4 squared delta x. And of course, again, here we're writing this uh, very tedious thing. Far better to use uh, sigma notation. So then uh, we could write it uh, as the summation from i equal 1 to 4 of pi times uh, f of ci squared delta x. So that's our estimation for the volume uh, using four cylinders. So here's a, uh, I don't uh, want uh, this, uh, this point to be lost, and that is that uh, trying to find the area of a, sh of a shape, what the integral is doing is it's cutting it into rectangles. Now, for these, these kinds of shapes that are like this, uh, we're not cutting these volumes into rectangles. What are we cutting them into? Cylinders. Right? So what we're doing is that we're saying that uh, uh, the way we're analyzing this shape is by cutting it into infinitely many infinitesimal cylinders. And uh, sort of the calculus point of view is that, uh, well, you know, if you, look at a, if you look at a shape, it might look smooth when you're sort of far away from it. But uh, if you use the 
calculus microscope and look at it, it actually consists of infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles. That's what it actually looks like when you get close. And uh, what we're saying is that uh, such shapes like this, it might look smooth uh, from far away, but uh, if you get close enough to it, the way it's going to be reckoned where volume is concerned is infinitely many infinitesimal cylinders. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, using... Instead of using uh, four cylinders, so let's, uh, you know, just writing, write using n cylinders. That's exactly the same formula, except uh, we just write n where we had four. Pi r squared h. <coughs> This is more or less where it's at with uh, engineering, is that uh, if you were making such a shape, you know, it might be the case that uh, 47 rectangles is sufficient for your problem. Uh, the calculus point of view is that uh, we're going to let the number of rectangles go, uh, go to infinity, or let the number of cylinders go to infinity. So I'll, uh, I'll copy this formula. I equal 1 to n pi r squared h and uh, I'm gonna I want to do something I want to write something uh, right here I left myself a spot right there uh, which is the is the mathematically means it's the it's the thing that says okay now we're gonna let the number of uh, cylinders go to infinity. So what do I need to write right here? Limit, right? So we're going to say limit as n goes to infinity of this thing. And then here yet again we do the standard calculus joke, which is uh, we've got uh, this formula that has Greek symbols in it and we compute a limit and then uh, the Greek symbols change alphabet. <laughs> Uh, from the Greek uh, alphabet to the Latin alphabet. And, uh, well, pi is a constant, so it's not subject to the joke, because pi is the circle constant. But uh, what is the Latin counter counterpart of uh, sigma? S. So that one uh, changes to good old S there. Uh, this pi is not uh, part of the joke. And then uh, the f at ci, that just becomes f of x. Now, uh, delta, that's a Greek uh, letter that's subject to the joke. What is the Latin counterpart? D. And now, uh, the fact uh, that this is a summation means we need to go back to where this all began, right? And so do you remember that, uh, in fact, it was a uh, between A and B. So finally, to make it right, like so. <clears throat> so here's a formula now that uh, you are expected to memorize. But uh, I want to sort of, um, I want to point out to you that uh, this is this is in some way as natural as, as, uh, as, as could possibly be. Because what this is saying, this is saying, add up all of the pi r squared H's. So every one of those is pi r squared h, and you're going to add them all up. So in, at any rate, my claim is that uh, th this formula is a, can, can be memorized, and it's a, it's a reasonable thing, what it's saying. Any question about it? OK, well then, uh, let's do one. Uh, what I mean is let's uh, actually actually do uh, an exercise. <clears throat> OK.
Okay. Uh, let uh, let R be the region between y equal x plus 1, y equals 0, uh, and between x equal 1 and x equal 4. So uh, that describes the region. Let uh, S be the solid of revolution obtained by revolving R about the x-axis. Kind of wordy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you got to be a little bit precise, otherwise you risk uh, ambiguity. So R is uh, some region, which is to say it's some sort of two-dimensional thing. Uh, S is a solid, so it's a three-dimensional thing. Uh, the instructions are one, sketch R, two, sketch S, and three, find uh, the volume of S. <clears throat> okay, so any question about uh, the statement of the exercise? So uh, for those of you, you know, just keeping track of test-taking strategy uh, to a very strong degree, uh, the key word that signals that uh, you're on this kind of exercise and not some other kind of exercise is uh, the word revolution. <coughs> uh, good. So any questions before we s uh, get going on it? All right. So, uh, one, sketch R, well, that one's uh, not a big deal, uh, really, compared to the other stuff we've done, because we've done uh, much more complicated things than that, uh, even for uh, what you turned in today, right? Because you, you were doing parabolas and stuff. Well, uh, what, uh, when you plot it, what is this? It's a line. That's a line. And what's that one? A line. A line. Okay, well, and uh, these, these two, for that matter, those are also lines. So these are all lines. All right. Uh, fine. So, uh, in fact, the uh, the uh, x-axis is y equal to zero. So this is y equal to zero. And then, uh, what does uh, y equal x plus one look like when you plot it? Well, yes, but uh, there's a lot of them. I agree, but well, there's a lot of them too. Okay, good. So uh, it goes through the y-axis at uh, one here, and then yes, has a slope one from from there on. So this is uh, y is x plus one. Okay, then uh, now we need x is 1 and x is 4. So what do those look like? Vertical. Yeah, vertical lines. So then, uh, you know, more, more or less like uh, this. Uh, so if that's 1, uh, 2, 3, 4.
Okay, so uh, I've sketched all the things, but uh, in the end, uh, we need to make it clear that uh, we know what R is. So what's R with regard to this stuff? Question about it? So R is uh, R is uh, that that thing there. All right. So then now S S is uh, what you obtain uh, when you revolve it uh, this way. Okay. So then uh, try to imagine what it uh, what it looks like in your mind's eye. And uh, can anyone think of a of an object that uh, you know kind of describes it like a commonplace object. Lampshade, yeah. I think that's pretty good. Like a solid lampshade, you know? Because uh, that's like half of a lampshade, and then if you went, you know, went all the way around with it, it would just sort of sweep out a lampshade. But it'd be solid, right? Okay. So, let's see if we can draw it. <clears throat> So I'm going to just I ignore the x-axis since it's not uh, really relevant. So, and we're going to go a symmetric amount above and below. Symmetric amount above and below. Okay, so if that one's about right there, then now it needs its counterpart below, down here. Okay, so those are the same, above and below. And then now, if this one's about right here, it needs its symmetric counterpart, you know, down here-ish. Again, this is not an art class, okay? I'm not, uh, not going to get out a, a ruler and measure. But uh, what, what won't work, right, to give you an example of what, uh, what would not get credit, is if you were to draw from here a line that looks like this. Okay, then that wouldn't get credit because, uh, well, just look at it. Is that a symmetric uh, thing? It's not symmetric. Okay. So rather, to be symmetric, it's got to go out that way. All right, uh, then uh, to, to, to finish out the shape, uh, this would trace out a circle and in perspective it would kind of look like this ellipse. Kind of like a lampshade. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, this thing here is uh, R, the region, and this th uh, thing here is uh, S, the solid. Now, for those of you that uh, just like to know the names of things, uh, this actually, this, this thing really does actually have a name. Uh, uh, depending on the context, it might be called a truncated cone uh, because uh, you can see that uh, if the shaded region had actually extended all the way to that point, then this, the shaded region would be a triangle, and then uh, the shape swept out would have really been a cone. So this is kind of like a cone, but uh, someone cut the pointy end off of it. Uh, alternatively, uh, in different contexts, this shape is referred to as a frustum. Uh, and uh, we're all actually very familiar with frustums uh, because, uh, for example, um, this camera that we're looking at, uh, my hand is inside of the frustum, the viewing frustum of this camera. But if I go too far to the side, then uh, it's out of the viewing frustum. Now, if I take my finger and I move it straight up, so I'm moving it straight up, but uh, now it's actually outside of the frustum because the frustum is actually, is actually a cone that uh, comes out about like that. It's not really a cone. What it really is, it's because, of the, because the aperture is square. It's actually uh, uh, a truncated pyramid. But at any rate, uh, when you watch 
uh, a movie or you play a video game, the actual thing that you can see is referred to as the viewing frustum. A frustum. Very good. So now we want to actually find uh, the volume. <clears throat> Any questions before we move to finding the volume? Oh, you mean like uh, writing this? Yeah. I mean, it's a good idea. You know. Yeah, like so. I mean, uh, again, uh, this, you know, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, uh, none of the graduate students are artists either. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so uh, I'm, I'm one of the graders and then uh, the, uh, the, uh, the other ones are graduate students. They get it. So... Yes, please. Okay. Uh, good. So then, uh, what's the what would be the formula for uh, for this then? So it would be an integral, right? So here I'll copy down I'll copy down the abstract formula. It's integral a to b, and then remember that the formula for a cylinder is pi r squared h. So it's pi r squared H. And then now it's just a matter of sort of like uh, plugging, plugging stuff in uh, where, where it goes. So what are the limits of integration? One to four. The pi is just a, a pi. Uh, what is the, the function? The f. x plus one. And then dx, well, that's just dx. So there it is. I'm not sure I understand. Well, uh, in the end, you've, got to, you've just got to understand that uh, uh, you look at uh, this, this formula back here and say, OK, well, well, let me ask it this way. What is the formula for that? Y equals zero. We'll talk about that. But, uh, but, but we have not yet. Okay, so any question about uh, why this is the, in the end, the formula? Okay, so now this is uh, this is an integral. Uh, <coughs> pardon me, an integral that we could have done uh, weeks ago. Okay, so from here I'm going to move pretty quick, but I'll remark that uh, getting the things sketched and getting the getting arriving at the conclusion that uh, it is after all this integral that must be evaluated, getting to here is about uh, seven or eight uh, out of ten points. The rest of it, actually successfully evaluating the integral, is the balance. Okay, but uh, the thing that's being tested on this one is, you know, can you, you know, can you make it to the, the integral? Okay. So, uh, all right. We would love to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is to say that uh, somehow we want to find an antiderivative. If we could find an antiderivative, that would be excellent. So uh, ignoring the fact that this is an integral for a moment and just looking at the corresponding antiderivative, uh, you know, can we think of one? Well, let's go through, uh, let's go through the procedure. Uh, so we want, we want to use the FTC, uh, which means that uh, we want to find an antiderivative. So, I'm gonna, so the first thing that we always ask is, uh, is this one known? So is that specifically one of the known ones? Now, we can ignore the pi because the, the integral is homogeneous. So that one, you know, that one just d doesn't affect it. Yeah, it's a constant. So uh, to remind you, it's been a while maybe since we've thought about it. Uh, how many how many antiderivatives do we know? Three, right? So let's uh, write them down. The antiderivative of x to n dx. Uh, this one is known as the power rule. Its formula uh, is that it becomes x to n plus one over n plus one, and then plus a constant. 
And this works for almost every n. But uh, it doesn't work for which n? Negative 1. Uh, which is kind of weird to think that uh, we've got a formula that works for every conceivable n except that one. Uh, well, we've got another formula that, uh, in a sense, plugs that hole. So uh, what, is, what is the answer when n is uh, negative 1? Mm-hmm. And then plus a constant. Okay. This is one of the neat little surprises, uh, to me anyway, in calculus, that there should be a formula that works for every n in the world, except for that one. And that one is somehow that. It's kind of surprising until uh, you get a little bit further in math and you can kind of get a broader context and say, oh yes, it had to be that. It couldn't have been anything else. Okay. But for now, I just want to just remark again that mm, that's kind of surprising. Uh, the other one that we know is uh, the antiderivative of the exponential of x. dx is the exponential of x plus a constant. OK. Just to remind ourselves that those are the three. And uh, also, don't, uh, don't be misled. It's not that these are the only three that exist ever. Uh, it's, it is rather that uh, these are the only three that we use in this class. If you go on to greener pastures uh, and, and use math in a more advanced context, you'll have tables and tables of these. OK. Uh, so, so is this uh, exactly one of these three? It is not. Uh, it is not because in the end, uh, well, I'll say it like this. If I, if I were to sort of commit and say, which one does this seem most like? Well, I'd have to say it seems most like this one. Uh, because I can ignore the pi because of the homogeneity. Uh, and if that, you know, if it were, uh, if it were instead x plus 1, if it was just x, it, it would in fact be exactly this one. Okay. So, but in that sense, it's not known. Uh, can we do something algebraic? And the answer actually is yes, we can do something. Uh, specifically, what we can do is uh, we can foil uh, we can foil the x plus one squared. Uh, if we do that, then uh, it becomes uh, the integral one to four of pi, and then well, foiling this out, uh, that'd be x squared plus two x plus 1 dx. OK? Uh, the reason why is because that's the f term, xx. That's the l term, ll. And then the o and the i term are both x times 1 and x times 1. So this is a 1x plus another 1x. All right? So now, uh, again, we could uh, keep the pi factored out. And each one of these terms, we can use the power rule on. So like the antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3. Antiderivative of 2x is x squared. And the antiderivative of 1 is x. So can we agree that uh, we could uh, do it from here? We could do it from here. Uh, but uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a slightly different way. Uh, and it's going to lead to uh, there, there's going to it's going to lead to a faster way. So I'm going to take this slightly different way. Okay. <clears throat> we could do this, uh, but uh, I, I want to illustrate something else. Uh, so supposing uh, that the answer was no to, to the can we do something algebraic, then what's the next step? A variable differential substitution. So again, I'm just going to copy this down so we don't have to keep, uh, so I don't have to flip pages. Uh, so it was 1 to 4, 
and then pi r squared h. Okay, so then uh, the third step is that, uh, well, let's try a variable differential substitution. All right, what do you want to, what do you want to offer as the substituted uh, thing? X plus one, I think. So if we say that uh, u is uh, x plus one, then uh, this is the variable. Uh, the, the variable part of the variable differential substitution. Uh, so the variable we're calling u, what's the name for the differential? Just, just du. So du dx, uh, that's called a derivative. But the individual pieces, those are referred to as uh, differentials. So, uh, well, to that end, uh, if we write the derivative du dx, well, what is the derivative of x plus 1 with respect to x? 1. Because the derivative of x is 1, and the derivative of 1 is 0. So solving for the differential du, du is uh, dx. So this is the, the differential part. OK. Uh, now, these limits, these limits are from 1 to 4. And you need to keep in mind that this is from x is 1 to x is 4. And uh, because I'm changing variables from x's to u's, I'm going to go ahead and change these uh, limits from x limits to u limits, uh, which is to say that uh, using this formula, my question is, is that uh, what is u when x is 1? Well, it'll be 2, because it'll be uh, 1 plus 1, which is 2. And then uh, what is u when x is 4? It'd be 5, because it'd be 4 plus 1, which is 5. So these are the limits. OK, so uh, all right, we'll do it. So this would be uh, the integral now from uh, 2 to 5 pi uh, u squared du. All right. So now, is this exactly one of the ones that we know? <clears throat> so then it would be uh, pi and then uh, u cubed over 3 from 2 to 5. All right, so now we want to uh, evaluate this. So I'm going to make this look just slightly different before I commit uh, to, the, to evaluating. So I'm going to express it like this. Now, the reason why I'm going to uh, express it that way is because, uh, <clears throat> remember, that uh, when you have uh, such an expression like this, um, and you have pi over 3, uh, a constant, then you can leave that uh, constant factored out, and then just evaluate the u part at uh, the individual points. So this would be 5 cubed minus 2 cubed, like so. So to remind you. We've done this before, but uh, I'll be happy to remind you again. Uh, this is something that is of the form k multiplied by some function h of t evaluated from a to b, like so. So notice that there's a constant k there. You can leave the k factored out and then just uh, write it as uh, h of b minus h of a. Like so. So that's what I've uh, done here with the pi over 3. Uh, all right. Well, what's 5 cubed? 1, 2, 5. And then 2 cubed is 8. The difference of those is 117. So this would be pi over 3 times 
117. And then, uh, you know, uh, let's see if we should simplify this. Is 117 divisible by 3? It is. It is. But, uh, you know, how can I say so confidently that uh, it surely is? Right. Let's consider the individual digits, 1, 1, and 7, and add them up. 1 plus 1 plus 7 is 9. Is, is 9 divisible by 3? It is, and therefore so is 117. And uh, that works as many times as you want, which is to say that if you had like a, if you had like a number that had like a 20 digits in it, big number, then you can just take all the digits and add them up uh, and get a number. And if that number is still big, do it again. And you just keep doing it until it's small enough to where you're able to quickly say yes or no. So 1 plus 1 plus 7 is 9, so the answer is yes. Uh, so then it'll be uh, 39 pi. Because that's 117 over 3. Uh, but what's the meaning of this number? It's not an area. It's a volume, right? It's a volume of that frustum. So what we're saying is that, uh, therefore, the volume of the thing that looks like this uh, is uh, 39 pi. You know, so if this was like in some suitable units like centimeters, I don't have any idea, then uh, this, would, this would mean something like it would take 39 pi liters to fill it up. Good. Any question about this? Now, what I'm telling you is that uh, we could have, uh, we could have uh, evaluated exactly this integral and gotten to the same answer. But it would have been a little bit uh, grosser. It would have been a little ugly, uh, is what I mean to say. So now, uh, here's the thing. is uh, Now I want to show you how to take an integral that is like this one and basically jump right to the final answer, like immediately. Because uh, once you see uh, a little, uh, once you have a little insight, uh, you can see that uh, these are actually uh, very straightforward. Okay. Specifically, uh, what if we consider, say, uh, the antiderivative of, uh, how about, 5 multiplied by w plus, uh, I don't know, it doesn't even matter, uh, 7 to exponent uh, 40 dw. So now the 5 is uh, not relevant. Uh, it doesn't affect the procedure much because, uh, well, antiderivative is homogeneous. So that 5 just sort of just hangs, is along for the ride. Uh, now, if that 7 were not there, if it were not there, then this would literally just be the power rule, right? It would be, uh, the answer would be w to exponent 41 and then divided by 41. That would be the answer. But uh, that 7 is there. So it's not like exactly the power rule. Uh, one thing we could do is we could uh, multiply this all out. <laughs> right? We could, do, we could do w plus 7 times w plus 7 times w plus 7 40 times. I'm not uh, recommending such a thing, but I'm, all I'm saying is that in principle uh, it could be done. OK. Uh, now, we could do a substitution, uh, and it's going to be just like we did it last time. So what I'm going to illustrate for you is uh, two different uh, methods, and uh, extremely quickly I'm going to do the variable differential substitution because it's just like the one we did last time. Uh, so writing something like uh, y is equal to w plus 7 that being the variable, then uh, the differential, I think you can agree, is just uh, dy is dw, just like last time. Uh, then there's no limits because this is an antiderivative, so we have none of that to deal with. And as a result, uh, 
we get to 5 multiplied by uh, what? y to 40 dy. And now it is exactly the power rule. So this would be 5 multiplied by y to 41 over 41 and then plus a constant. And then if this were the question, would this be the answer? No, because uh, we want to get back to the original symbol. So the answer would be uh, 5 multiplied by uh, what? W plus 7 to 41 over 41 plus a constant. Now here's the thing. Uh, look at the structure of this substitution, this one right here. So what we're saying is that uh, the only difference, the only difference between uh, Y and W is this addition of a constant. So such a thing is called a, a shift. So this substitution, uh, notice that uh, where the differentials are concerned, even though the variables are different, the differentials are the same. dy is exactly dw. The variables are different, but only by a shift. So, uh, you know, the math lingo for this is, is that uh, you could say something like uh, the, the variable differential substitution is uh, uh, for, for a shift is trivial because it causes the differentials to be identical. Uh, therefore, you can uh, just jump when you get uh, comfor comfortable with this exactly to here, which is to say that uh, is that exactly W plus 7? Uh, it, it is W plus 7, but is it exactly the power rule? It's not, but uh, it's so close that you can just jump to the answer. So that 5 hangs around. W plus 7 to 41 over 41 plus a constant. Okay, so let's have a, a quick example. Uh, what if uh, I gave you uh, one like the following? So antiderivative of, say, uh, the square root of z plus 8 dz. So what do you think? Okay, so we could uh, say that this is uh, antiderivative of z plus 8 to half dz, okay? Right, but uh, what I want you to do, uh, to, if, if you can, I'm not like mandating this. I'm saying that, uh, can you see that uh, if it were not for that plus 8, this would be an exact use of the power rule, if it were not for that plus h. Like if it weren't there, if I was just covering up a z, then we could jump directly to the answer. Well, what would the answer be if, if I were covering up a z? Yeah, it would be this thing to 3 over 2 and then over 3 over 2. And what I'm telling you is because that's just a shift. That's the answer. Z plus 8 to 3 over 2 over 3 over 2 plus a constant. That's the answer. Now, you could do this, something just like this. And you are invited to continue doing this if that's where you feel comfortable. But uh, I'm also inviting you when you're comfortable to not do this and uh, do this instead. There isn't? Uh, okay. I'm going to put an asterisk on there isn't and come back to that in about a minute. So, uh, now two pages ago or so, 
uh, we were doing an integral that looked like this. Okay, that's, uh, that's literally copied from two or three pages ago. Now, the pi, that's just a, a constant multiplier. So it's sort of out. Can you see that this is, this is up to a shift, this, a power rule, up to a shift? So that means that, uh, well, you should be able to tell me exactly the answer right now. It would be pi, and then uh, what? Mm -hmm. Over three. And then because it's an integral, you know, we, we're using the fundamental theorem, evaluating at the boundary. So now I'll do the same constant trick as before, pi over three, multiplied by x plus one cubed, evaluated from one to four, like so. And then, now let's plug in. So I keep uh, the pi over three out. <coughs> okay, and then, uh, gotta plug in now. So this would be uh, what? So what's, uh, at four, x plus one is five, so this would be five cubed, and then, uh, at 1, x plus 1 is 2, so this would be minus 2 cubed. And of course, that's exactly the same answer as before. But uh, can you agree that we accomplished the result in a significantly more compact way? Which is the point, right? We all, you know, we're all, we're all humans. You know, the word that we like to use is efficient. Uh, we like to be efficient. But uh, just pr possibly just as accurate of a word is, you know, we're all lazy, you know? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll retract we, we all, and I'll just say me, I, right? <laughs> uh, I being uh, lazy, I, uh, you know, I, I admit I prefer this. Okay. Now, that being said, uh, you've got to understand the limitations of this. Uh, that is to say that uh, this, this can be used, this can be used when this is the form, where it's exactly, uh, to be clear, It's got to be exactly <clears throat> one y. Is equal to one w. <clears throat> and then plus any constant. So such a thing is called a, a shift. So the constant here happens to be, for this one, happened to be seven, so that works. Uh, the constant uh, here happened to be eight, so that works. Now, uh, if it's not exactly that way, then it won't work. So for example, If I were to say uh, something like this, say the antiderivative of, uh, I don't know, uh, x squared plus 8 and then uh, cubed dx, would we be able to use the same trick? It, well, it wouldn't work. The reason why it wouldn't work uh, in the end is because, uh, notice, what has to be substituted is that, uh, is that uh, this has to be a w and that a dw. So they have to be, they have to be uh, commensurate in that way. So these are not in agreement. Not the same. Uh, therefore, we cannot use this trick. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, let's try another one. How about, how about, let uh, R be the region 
the region uh, below. Uh, y is 4 minus x squared and above y equals 0. Let s be the solid of revolution uh, obtained by revolving r about the x-axis. So, same instructions as before. One, uh, sketch R, two, sketch S, and three, uh, find the volume of S. All right. Well, in order to make uh, heads or tails of this, uh, you've got you've to be familiar with the various, uh, the various shapes here. So uh, when, you, uh, when you plot this one, y is uh, 4 minus x squared, uh, what will you see? Parabola. And then uh, when, when you're making such a sketch, uh, of a parabola, one of the most important things is to know, does it open down or up? In this case, down, right? Uh, the reason, because uh, the coefficient on the squared term is negative. So it's going to open down. Uh, and again, this is the x-axis. Okay. So uh, for one, It will look like this. So this is a plot of y is 4 minus x squared. And then y equals 0 uh, is that. So then uh, we've plotted all the, all the things. Uh, but in the end, to make it clear that, uh, that we've uh, identified exactly what R is, uh, we need to shade something in. So what is R? So above this one and below that one. Okay, good. So this is R. So any question about uh, finding R? Okay, then S is uh, what you get uh, when you when you rotate this one around. Okay. Let's give it a go. So again, it's the same sort of uh, basic idea, and that is okay. So to help myself out, I will uh, color that point uh, specifically green. And, and I'll put it there like so. And then uh, the symmetric point will be down here. Then. So something like that. So that's the top, and then kind of like this. And uh, these corners where they touch the x-axis, they're a little bit uh, pointy in the sense that uh, if you can imagine uh, you know, sweeping this object out, that'd be a pointy spot. Like it'd be able, it wouldn't be able to rest on it if you set it on, the, on a table. You'd kind of want to roll to the side. 
So if you were to trace that green point uh, as it uh, revolves, it would trace out a circle. Uh, but because we're looking at it uh, in perspective, you'll see uh, an ellipse that looks something like this. So you'd be able to see that, but uh, this part of the arc would be behind. And this is about uh, the extent of all that I'm asking uh, for, for a picture, because uh, I accept and acknowledge that this is uh, not an art class. Any question about uh, producing a sketch for, of RNS? All right. Uh, now, uh, as for the integral, the volume. So we need a formula now. So to remind you, the formula is integral a to b and then pi r squared h. So <clears throat> now we just need to uh, plug in all the different uh, bits. OK. Well, this would be uh, pi is just pi. What are we going to use for uh, f? 4 minus x squared. We'll square that. And then uh, like that. So now, uh, huh, well, it's not entirely clear what we're going to use for a and b, huh? Like right here, I mean. So what are we supposed to put here uh, in these places? Right. Uh, in the end, we need to, we need to know, that you can imagine that uh, the way the picture is oriented, this is, this is the furthest left and this is the furthest right. So we need to figure out how far to the left and how far to the right are we going, which is to say that uh, these, these two are like uh, that one and its counterpart on the other side. So to figure those out, So to find these, we need to, uh, we need to solve. Well, the, the, there's, there's two things going on. There's the red and there's the graphite. We need to solve uh, y equals 0 and y equals 4 minus x squared, uh, which is to say we need to set these two uh, y's next to each other. Uh, uh, we need to set these two y's equal to each other. <clears throat> so 0 is 4 minus x squared. <clears throat> okay, so then uh, how do you want to solve it? Okay. So x squared is 4. OK, then what? Square root of both sides, I, I take it to mean. OK, well, we can do this, but uh, I'll just remind, uh, remind you that uh, this, this is a little bit slippery. Okay, because what's the square root of 4? Well, the square root of 4 is 2. Uh, but what's the square root of x squared? It's the absolute value of x. And so now the question becomes, so this step right here, the square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. This is uh, historically what, uh, where students, in my experience, seem to mess up a lot. So now the question is, is that, uh, oh, what could I put inside of that absolute value so that a 2 would come out? A negative 2 would work? A positive 2 would work. OK, so then x is negative 2, or 
x is 2. So what that's saying is that, uh, what is that saying about these two? Yeah, the, those are the twos, right? Negative, the negative one and uh, the positive one. So uh, as a result, the integral that we need is negative 2 to 2 pi and then 4 minus x squared, square that, dx. All right. So again, uh, in some sense, we haven't really used any calculus yet beyond uh, the, identi the identification that this is the formula that we have to use. Okay? What we've really done is we've said, oh, okay, I know the calculus that I need to do, and uh, here we've got it, we've got it to the, essentially to the place. We identified, oh, that's the formula, that's the picture, so this is what we need to do. Getting to here is about seven or eight out of 10 points. Now we've got to actually do it. And that'll be the balance of the points. OK. <clears throat> so uh, we want to use the fundamental theorem. Let's go through the procedure. Is this known, one of the known antiderivatives? It's not. Uh, two, can we do something algebraic? We can, right? We can FOIL, right? That is to say, we could multiply this out and collect like terms. Okay. Uh, let's write that down. So negative two to two uh, pi, and then if we FOIL that out, well, the f term would be 4 times 4, so that'd be 16. Uh, what, would, uh, what would the o term be? So it would be, one, it would be that one times that one, right? So that would be like a minus 4 times x squared. What would be the i term? Yeah, same thing, right? So minus 4 times x squared. And then what would the L term be? Plus x to 4. Again, just reminding you, you know, this would be a, you know, F, O, I, and L. Fountain pens are great until they lose their, <laughs> till, till, till they lose their uh, sanity. No, it'll work. It's just, I just need to clean it. Uh, all right, so F-O-I-L. Uh, so then simplifying this a little bit, uh, negative 2 to 2 pi, and then uh, what, 16 minus 8 x squared uh, plus x to 4 uh, dx. So could we do this one? We could, because we could use the power rule on each individual term. But uh, I'm telling you, it would be a little gross. It would be a little gross uh, in the sense that uh, the arithmetic would get ugly. So we saved ourselves from having to do that last time by doing a substitution. Can we do that this time? Well, we definitely can't do the shift thingy. Why will the shift thingy definitely not work? Yeah, because that's x squared. All right, so the shift thingy is not going to work. Um, is there something else we could do? What if we did a substitution? So that is to say, I'm going to just briefly consider, could we do a variable differential substitution? You think? OK, so then what would we say u is? Okay, now here's the thing, and it's the reason why I'm sort of stressing that its name is the variable differential substitution. This is the variable that's on offer. What is the corresponding differential? So du, which is what?
negative 2x is the derivative, and to get to the differential, we have to say dx. So here's the thing. Every time you're going to do a variable differential substitution where the variable is a polynomial, the differential is always going to be a polynomial of one less degree. So if we were to substitute uh, a polynomial that has degree 2, we're going to need also a polynomial of degree 1 to show up. Is there a polynomial of degree 1? There isn't, right? So if we were doing a, a substitution with a polynomial, polynomial of degree 8, we would need a polynomial of degree 7 somewhere to be its counterpart. Okay, so this isn't going to work. Okay, well, that means that, uh, you know, as it happens, sometimes, sometimes the, uh, the clumsy way is the only way. Well, it's just a part of life, I guess. Uh, so that's not going to work. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll use that one. Which is to say, uh, we'll use the gross one. Uh, so that would give us, uh, what, pi, and then the antiderivative of each term, so that would be 16 x, and then minus 8 thirds x cubed, and then plus a fifth x to 5, and then this evaluated from negative 2 to 2. So any questions how I, uh, how I got this one? And then from here, uh, it's just, uh, you know, just some arithmetic. So let's do it. So pi multiplied by leaving the pi uh, factored out. Uh, at 2, that would be uh, 32. And then subtract uh, 8 thirds times 8, because uh, 2 cubed is 8 and then plus a fifth, and then what's a 2 to exponent 5? 32. So if you have not uh, done it uh, already, uh, I'll just let you know that it's probably in your interest to memorize the powers of 2 uh, up to like 10, uh, which is to say that uh, you should be able to just rattle off. 2 to exponent 7 is? 128. So it's probably, if you're in a math class, a calculus class, uh, it, it might be good of you to just know that. But you have a calculator, too. Uh, finally, uh, doing the evaluation at the le lesser endpoint, this would be uh, negative 32. And then uh, minus 8 thirds. Negative 2 to exponent 3 is negative 8 and then plus a fifth, and then what's a negative 2 to exponent 5? Negative 32. All right, so this would be uh, pi, and then just simplifying a little bit, uh, what? This would be 32 minus 64 over 3, uh, plus 32 over 5, and then subtract uh, negative 32 plus 64 over 3 minus uh, 32 over 5. And so now then, uh, you know, it just goes on from here. This is just uh, boring. So you do this. But that's what I meant, is that uh, the arithmetic, it could just be gross. <clears throat> Any question about it? Finally, we're going to consider, we're going to uh, consider a new idea, uh, and then we're going to have a quiz. So more or less, uh, I would say, you can kind of relax a little bit. We're just going to talk about the new idea, and we'll retread the same ground, but quickly on, uh, on Thursday, but uh, I want this idea to be stewing in your head so that we're ready to 
roar out of the gate on Thursday. All right. So uh, here we go. What if I gave you two numbers? X1 equal to 13 and uh, X2 equal to 26. Uh, and I said, uh, find the average. Well, what would you do? Yeah? Yeah, you add them up and divide by two. Okay. So yeah, it's not like a, not like a secret, <laughs> you know. Uh, so you add them up, x plus one, add them both up over two, and uh, if you do that uh, arithmetic uh, carefully, well, that'd be uh, 13 plus 26, that'd be 39, divided by two is 19 and a half. But then, what I want you to understand what that 19 and a half means is that uh, we had a population of size two. If we were to replace every member of that population with value 19 and a half, You know, if we were to say instead, uh, y1 is 19 and a half, and y2 is 19 and a half. So still, here we have a different population, but still has two members in it. What's going to be the average value of this population? 19 and a half. That's what average means. So like, we could take all of us in here, see? And then we could measure all of our height in centimeters. And just for sake of argument, let's say that the average height is 160 centimeters. And then if we were to physically arrange each of us so that we were all, in fact, exactly 160 centimeters, and then recompute the average, what would the new average be? 160 centimeters. That's what, uh, that's what average means. All right. What if, uh, what if instead uh, x1 uh, you know, we have, uh, has value 13, x2 has value 26, x3 has uh, value uh, 20, and x4 has value 18. So now, to find the average, we add them all up and divide by 2, right? No, right? <laughs> what would we do? We, we would add them all up and divide by 4. So uh, it's a... In, 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 the, in the process of computing an average, it's uh, critical for you to keep track of how big the population is. Right? So uh, in this case, uh, the average would be x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 over 4. And if we were to use a calculator and, uh, and uh, calculate this out, I won't even pretend to try and do it, uh, let's say that it's 25. What that means is that uh, if we had another population with exactly four members and they all had value 25, then the average of that population would be 25. So it's like what it is is you're replacing a, uh, a population that's not constant with a population that uh, is constant. Okay. So then if we had uh, instead of uh, just four, what if we had uh, x1, x2, uh, x3, all the way up to xn. So we had uh, n different measurements. How could we compute uh, the average in that case? Well, add them all up and divide by n. So it would be x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus xn over n. But uh, we can write the numerator in a nicer way. We can say that this is. Uh, the summation from i is 1 to n of xi, like so, and then that all over n. And then uh, division by n is the same as multiplication by what? One over n. So this would be uh, one over n multiplied by this. So now here's the thing. Uh, whoops, I equal 1 to n of xi. So anytime that uh, you see uh, a big sigma in a math class, 
and especially a calculus class, uh, that's your signal that uh, probably we're about to come to an integral. Okay, but uh, not today, because we're going to do that on Thursday. But that being said, here's the thing that, uh, to foreshadow the big thing we want to do, is that uh, what if instead of there being uh, finitely many numbers, like this, this n could be big, it could be like a million, but uh, what if we had infinitely many numbers? Then we couldn't use this formula. We couldn't use this formula because uh, then we'd have 1 over infinity, which is 0. All right. When n goes to infinity, what are we going to do? In the end, uh, this is uh, the question that we're going to address first thing on Thursday. <clears throat> is that we're going to say, here is a function. Now, how many points are on that function? Infinitely many. So if we wanted to figure out what the average output of this function is, what we're saying, what we want, is we want a function that uh, instead of having possibly a different output at every place, we want a function with a constant output. So a constant function looks like a horizontal line. And what we want is we want a function that's constant. And we want it to be the case that the area under the red curve is the same as the area under the green curve. We want those two areas to be the same. So we want a constant function Uh, with area the same as this one. So can you see uh, what it is that we'll be seeking? Somehow we want to figure out what is that, uh, what is that height? Just like uh, if we had a population of two individuals whose measurements were 13 and 26, a constant population would have still two uh, members, but uh, measurement 19 and a half, all of them. Okay? So now let's uh, do a quiz. So any questions before we do that? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, they're definitely related in the sense that this is a rectangle, but this one is somehow special in the sense that we are, we are finding a rectangle that uh, is exact, right? It's like this rectangle, what I mean is that uh, this isn't an estimate, like this one is perfect. Uh, in the sense that, you know, if I was a perfect artist, the amount where th this is over would be exactly the amount that this is under. Okay. So that it's like, like perfect, e even though it's constant. Thank <laughs> you.